All right, we're going to go ahead and graph uh, quadratic functions in the form of ax squared plus c, and we're going to kind of see what c does today. Okay, so uh, first thing I'm going to do is graph x squared plus 5 and compare it to the uh, parent function f of x equals x squared. So actually, let's go ahead and put the points in for f of x equals x squared. So just the parent function real quick, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, and then 3, 9. Okay, and then negative 1, 1, and negative 2, 4, and negative 3, 9. Okay, so just having those points in there will help us to compare here. So uh, we'll switch up colors and x squared plus 5. I'm going to go ahead and put that into our uh, work area here. And remember, your vertex is always at 0 as long as there is not a B term. So if we, if we think of um, our parent or excuse me, our standard form, ax squared plus bx plus c, and you look at it and there's not a b term, then the vertex will always start at x equals 0, which also means your axis of symmetry is at x equals 0. Okay, so when we substitute 0 in for x and add 5 to that, 0 plus 5 is 5, that moves our vertex from 0, 0 on our parent function up to 0, 5 for our new function. And we can put in 1 and 1 squared plus 5. That gives us 6. 1 and 6. Okay, and then 2. 2 squared plus 5. That gives us 9. And then we'll go the other way, negative 1. So negative 1 squared plus 5 is 6. And so if you recall, that's just a reflection of this point. So this point will be a reflection over here as well. So when I put negative 2 in, negative 2 squared plus 5 actually gives me 9 as well. And so you see this parabola right here. And that parabola is actually moved up from our parent function, right? Each one of those points has moved up five units is actually a vertical translation of five. So when we compare it to our parent function, it's a vertical translation. Translation means we're sliding it up five. Okay? Notice our vertex went from zero zero to zero five. Our domain is still all real numbers because every x value will give you an output for f of x. And our range, our range is, where does our graph start on the um, y-axis? Well, get rid of some of these arrows here. Okay. Notice this graph starts here at 5 and it moves upward. Okay, so it exists from 5 up, so it's at y is greater than or equal to 5. Okay, so really this 5, where our vertex is, notice that's what we added here. So that c term tells us where how far our graph moved up there. Let's see if that holds true on the next one. All right, we have now 2x squared minus 6 that we're going to graph. And notice there's a 2 and a minus 6. So let's put our parent function in there again. 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, and 3, 9. Reflect those points. All right. And so that's that. Remember, our vertex is always going to start at 0 if there's not a B term. So that's 2 times 0 squared plus, minus 6. So 0 squared is 0 times 2 is 0. So, yep, we're at minus 6, negative 6. That's going to be our new vertex, and that's what C is. So C tells us where our it moves our graph up and down. Okay. If there's not a B term, it also tells us what the Y value of our vertex is. Now, when we have a B term, it doesn't tell us the Y value of our vertex. It actually tells us something else, and we'll get to that when we put B in there. But for now, it's moving our graph up and down, which means our vertex is going down to negative 6, which just happens to be that C term. Our vertex, 0, negative 6. 
Axis of symmetry, remember, that's always this number. It's going to be key for our next lesson here, x equals 0. We're going to put in our 1, 2 times 1 squared minus 6. That's 2 minus 6, or negative 4. And then 2 times 2 squared minus 6, or positive 2. Okay, so we have 1, negative 4. Just a nice little close-up there. And then 2, 2. Reflect those points over. And notice our graph got kind of skinny there. It got skinny because, remember what that 2 does. That 2 is actually a an A term, that's a vertical stretch. It means it's stretching away from the x-axis by a factor of 2. Okay, so comparing it to x, the 2 is a vertical stretch. BAFO 2. And the minus 6 is a vertical translation down 6. And you have to go in that order. Okay, so the stretch comes before the translation. All right. The domain. The domain is all real numbers. The range. Y has to be greater than or equal to. It starts down here at negative 6 now and goes up. So negative 6. Notice I didn't fill in the rest of the table because I just reflected the points there. If you have a teacher that gets a little uh, type A about that, then you want to put those points in there. Okay, there we go. I would not be that teacher. So, Next one, I'm going to go ahead and let f of x equal negative 1 half x squared plus 4 and g of x equal f of x minus 6. So notice it gets a little weird in the formation we're writing it. All right. So first describe the transformation from the graph of f to the graph of g. So looking at g, I'm taking whatever f is, that, they're the same, and I'm subtracting 6. Well, that minus 6 is happening outside of the parentheses. So it's a, it's a vertical, it's a vertical translation. Okay. So describing the transformation, well, that's a vertical translation, and it's going down 6. Okay. What's it translating down 6? Well, it's translating this graph down 6. So we're going to graph this, and then because of that minus 6, we're going to move everything down 6. That's what it's saying. Okay, so let's go ahead and graph f. All right. So we've got our negative 1 half x squared plus 4. Remember, our vertex is still going to be at 0 because there's not a b term. So negative 1 half times 0 squared plus 4, or uh, we have 0, 4. Oops, not 0, negative 4. Okay, and then we're going to put in, rather than going with 1, let's go with 2 because we're going up by 2, or we have a denominator that's even. So we have negative 1 over 2 times 2 squared plus 4. So that gives us a grand total of 2. So we got 2, 2. So right there. And then we're going to put in 4. So we have negative 1 half times 4 squared plus 4, which gives us negative 4. So 4, negative 4 is right there. We'll reflect those places over across the axis of symmetry. And we have that there. And there is our f of x graph. And I did not curve that really well, so let's go ahead and curve that right there. Okay, so since that's our f of x, we're going to call label each of those branches f. Now, when we're dealing with g, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and take this g, we're going to move each of these points down 6. So this point is going to go down 6 to right there. This point is going to go down 6 to right here. This point is going to go down 6 to right there. And this point is going to go down 6 to there. And this one down 6 to there. So we end up with a graph that looks something like that right there. 
that is the graph of G. So let's go ahead and write the equation of G in terms of X. So G of X equals F of X. f of x minus 6. So what we're going to do is we're going to substitute for f of x the negative 1 half x squared plus 4. And then we're going to have our minus 6 on the outside. That ends up giving us negative 1 half x squared. Well, 4 minus 6 just happens to be negative 2. It's g of x. And you'll notice if you look at that equation and you look at our graph, well, g vertex is at 0, negative 2, which is what our C term is, is negative 2. Okay? And it's not getting any wider or narrower because they both have negative 1 half for our A term. All right, well, we have one more thing here and mm -hmm. talk about zeros of functions. So recall back to when we talked about um, uh, solving equations. So for instance, if you add f of x equals um, x plus 2 and x minus 4, and I said, well, I want to know what, what x equals. Well, what we did is we said, well, when f of x, or y, equals 0, we solved our equation for that. We said, okay, well, if that's true, then if x plus 2 times x minus 4 equals 0, then either this has to be 0, which means x would equal negative 2, or this would have to be 0 which means x would have to equal 4. Okay, well, that was, that was what we ended up with there. And so um, what we did with that, or what we can do with that, is you can think, well, you have a parabola, and that parabola might look something like that, and it would cross right here at negative 2, and cross right here at 4, and those coordinates are actually 4, 0 and negative 2, 0. Those are x-intercepts. That's what those points mean. So a 0 of a function is also an x-intercept of the graph of the function. A 0 is when the value of x causes a function to equal 0. Okay, right? So when we substitute 0 in for y and solve, that's going to give us zeros of function. So negative 2 and 4 were zeros of that function. Those are x-intercepts of the graph. So the way we can use that, well, you can use that doing, um, you know, when you're, when you're graphing or when you're solving problems here, it helps you, helps you to see maybe a picture. So when an object is dropped from a height, from its height, h in feet, um, t seconds after it has been dropped, it can be modeled by the equation h equals negative 16 t squared plus h sub 0. h sub 0 is an initial height, so really anything sub 0 is usually an initial or a starting value. Okay, so h sub 0 is an initial height. This is actually a formula that you'll use in, if you're in my class, you'll use it on your assignments, so don't lose it there. A brick is dropped from a 100-foot bridge crossing a river. So say we have this... Um, we have this, this uh, bridge crossing a river. We're dropping, we're dropping a brick from it. Okay, that's, we're up here at 100 feet. Okay, so up here at 100 feet, we're dropping this brick, and it's falling down, and it's hitting the water down below. So we've got this water. Okay, well, what we've just drawn there is we've drawn a y-axis, which we're calling height, right? Our y in context of this problem is h. And we have an x-axis, which we're calling time. Okay, our x-axis in this problem, or x in this problem is t, right? So what we're trying to see is, when we drop from 100 feet, how long does it take to hit the ground? All right, well, we're going to go ahead and write the equation by substituting h sub 0 from our problem here. Okay, our starting height is 100. So write the equation. Well, that's going to be one, or h equals negative 16t squared. So zero, it's 100. Okay. Now, if we want to actually solve it, 
and how long does it take for the brick to hit the water? Well, when the brick hits the water, our height's no longer 100, it's, what's it, zero? So we're going to substitute zero in for h, and then solve our equation. Well, if you look at it, it's kind of like what we did up here, except for we don't have to factor this one because there's no b term. We could just move the 100 over. So we get subtracting 100 on both sides. Could then divide it by negative 16. So we get 100 over 16. Notice a negative and a negative to make a positive. And then I'm going to take the square root. Well, t is going to be equal to the square root of 116. Whenever you impose a square root, you want to put plus or minus. But in this case, you're in context of this problem, t stands for time. Positive time makes sense, negative time doesn't. So the plus and minus really doesn't matter much in here. The square root of 10, or 100 is 10. The square root of 4, 16 is 4. So time is equal to 10 fourths, or if we reduce it, it's equal to 3 fifths, or excuse me, 3 halves. Excuse me, not three halves, five halves. My apologies. And five halves is the same thing as 2.5. So T is 2.5 when H is 100. And we get 2.5. What is that? Well, that's 2.5 seconds. So when we drop a brick from 100 feet high, as long as we're just dropping it and not throwing it, we're just dropping it. Gravity does its work, and it takes 2.5 seconds to hit the water. All right. Well, that's all I got for you. Good luck.